Is the last time that I saw you in Beijing? I think so. It's been a while. Just before the pandemic hit, and now we're here again talking about U.S.-China trade tensions. Are things don't change. I know, and we just heard from the Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson saying that, you know, one virtual summit will not change things. Let's not kid ourselves. How much does this lower the temperature, and what are the challenges that still remain? Well, I think the underlying issues are still there, but this is an important step that at least we're talking now and talking at the highest levels, and at least creating a work program around things like the, the nuclear arsenal uh, that will help de-escalate tensions. There's still work to be done on the trade issues. Uh, they, they were not dealt with in great depth during the summit, and those issues remain outstanding. And of course, there might be some disappointment here in Asia because Secretary uh, Raimondo also just confirming that the U.S. is not really going to be rejoining the CPTPP, that key regional trade agreement, anytime soon. What are the prospects here when there is criticism that the U.S. administration does not have a broader economic vision for the region? Well, I think that the, the Biden administration has begun to lay out that vision and has talked about an Indo-Pacific economic framework of some sort to complement what they're doing in the strategic and the political realms. And that's why Secretary Raimondo and Ambassador Tai are traveling around the region to begin having that dialogue, to begin to re-engage, which I think is very important and very much valued here. But at the same time, we are seeing Beijing trying to join the CPTPP. How much of a disadvantage would that leave the U.S. administration? Well, CPTPP is a very high standard agreement, and so the ability of any country to join is really going to be, the burden is going to be on them to demonstrate that they can live up to those uh, high standards. Um, I think whether or not uh, the, the China joins the CPTPP, what's important is the U.S. re-engages with the region, shows leadership, we are a Pacific power, and finds ways that work politically at home, but also from a, an economic perspective, to, to integrate with the region and to help build on, for example, the digital economy dynamics that are so critical. In this more fractured environment, does it make it more difficult to do business for MasterCard, especially in China? Well, we are involved in, in, in every market around this region. We've been doing uh, cross-border business in China for some time. And uh, earlier this year, we, we received a preliminary approval of our license application to do domestic business. And we look forward to receiving final approval so that we can begin to, to do that business. So we try to be local where we need to be local while still maintaining the advantages of being a global company. We are now hearing reports that perhaps MasterCard will have an advantage when it comes to dealings with Amazon. Can you confirm those talks? Well, we've had a long-standing uh, good relationship uh, with Amazon. I have nothing to comment on the, the particular conversations going on right now other than to say we've been working with Amazon for, for years to provide their customers with the ability to, to engage in e-commerce uh, efficiently and safely. So perhaps a co-branded credit card with Amazon is on the cards? Well, I think you have to talk to them about that. But I, all I'd say is that we're very much committed to continuing to work with them to help their customers do business well. Will we have any idea of volumes at this point? Not, not at this point. I think yeah, they're a very valuable partner of ours, and we'll continue to develop that relationship. What are some of the challenges that MasterCard is seeing, uh, whether globally or in China as well? Not to mention that, of course, we have seen a lot of uh, crypto-related uh, measures coming from MasterCard as well. Well, the, the whole uh, development of cryptocurrencies, of digital currencies, broadly defined, central bank digital currencies, stable coins, as well as other cryptocurrencies, there's a lot of dynamism a lot of innovation, and we're committed to ensuring that whatever we do with that sector, it, it's customer uh, value related, that it's consistent completely with regulators and their expectations, that there's a level playing field. Uh, but we are a multi-rail company. We're, we're not just a credit card company, and we're committed to providing customers with choice in terms of how they want to pay and how they want to get paid. Financial inclusion, of course, has been a key theme for MasterCard, right? How does crypto and perhaps blockchain, the technology itself, help here? I think blockchain opens up a number of possibilities in, in all sorts of areas, including uh, provenance, including B2B payments. Uh, we're, we've been committed to, to financial inclusion long before there was discussion of cryptocurrencies or blockchain. Uh, six years ago, we see it laid out the goal of bringing half a billion people who are unbanked into the financial system. We achieved that and doubled down. Now we have a goal of a billion people, 50 million micro merchants, 25 million women entrepreneurs, and we're managing it like any other goal of the company. Everybody's involved in making sure 
sure that we achieve those objectives. Who are your biggest competitors right now globally? Because, of course, the Amazon issue also comes at a time when we're seeing a shift away from the e-commerce side from Visa. Well, I, I think our biggest competitor is really cash. It's not any particular uh, company. We work with fintechs. We work with uh, uh, global digital players. Uh, we work with everybody. We work with governments. Uh, but uh, the, the secular shift of people moving from cash to digital payments, I think, is probably the most important dynamic in our in our sector. And COVID, frankly, accelerated that trend. Mm. COVID really underscored just how important it is to be connected to the digital economy. And we saw a, a significant rise in e-commerce and online uh, engagement. We saw small businesses going from being mom and pop brick and mortar businesses to going online and becoming e-commerce players. And we've been helping them do that. And we've seen governments engage with their citizens through digital payments in a way that really advances that secular shift from cash to the digital economy. Which cuts sort of both ways, right? Because at the same time, you are seeing concerns over data storage, privacy, perhaps more in Asia, especially countries like India or China. Well, it's very important. As, as the digital economy expands, data will become all the more important. And hence, the value of having really strong data responsibility principles. From our perspective, the individual owns their data, should benefit from data, should control their data. Our job is to is to protect their data. We want to make sure we all of our products are privacy by design. We want to make sure that we're protecting individuals' data and their privacy while at the same time benefiting from an open digital economy.